Thank you, everyone. Welcome, everyone. My name is Michael Pearson. Uh, I'm the president of the Humanistic Management Association. I welcome you all to this wonderful occasion to have Jeff Pfeffer join us. And the topic of this conversation is humanizing organizations, a futile endeavor. And who better to be with us than somebody that has de dedicated his life to this conversation, uh, to this question. And um, while I'm trying to mute people that are currently not muted. <laughs> uh, the technical oh. problems of life. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so there we go. Um, uh, we, uh, we want, I would just want to make sure that everybody understands the context in which we are having these conversations, organizing them. So Jeff, you also get a bit of a background of what the Humanistic Management Association is and who the people are that are joining. So we are a, a group of people, academics, practitioners, uh, professionals in the larger context, including policymakers that aim to create an economy in service to life. The Aristotelian definition of a eudaimonia <laughs> system that works for, towards flourishing. And we think that management is a key function uh, in that process. And it's been oftentimes seen as what we consider economistic. And Jeff, you've been writing about the dominance of economics as the queen of social science in guiding much of thought in the management disciplines and beyond in the social sciences. And I think that there is a bigger problem here uh, of a mindset that, that we need to unlock and that may be also at the core of the reason why we have such trouble with getting humanize human organizations going. So um, this is the, the main thrust of the Humanistic Management Association. The uh, focal point is the protection of dignity and the promotion of well-being as managerial tasks. And Jeff Beffer is here to join us and I am so grateful that you have the time that this is working. Uh, in the for formal introduction, you are uh, the Thomas D. D. Uh, the second professor, a junior professor of organizational behavior at Stanford University. And I think the books that you've been write, writing just in the, in the past sort of speak to your, your what I would consider humanistic research agenda over, over the time, dying for a paycheck, leadership BS, the human equation, power and the knowing doing gap and hard, hard facts and the relevance of evidence-based management. And just reading those titles, I'm thinking that, wow, you know, there's so much evidence, the knowing doing gap, we know about it. You've been writing on your blogs also about this is really, everybody knows it's so trivial and still we don't do it. Uh, so the question then, is it futile? Now, I want to turn it over. I hear that some people have trouble hearing me well. I'm going to stop talking, but I want to thank everybody for being on and I want to thank Jeffrey for being on with us and maybe just take it, um, uh, take over. Okay. Thanks. Nice. I'm hearing some static, but hopefully you can hear me. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. So I'm not sure I can address the question of whether or not uh, building humanistic organizations are futile because I cannot really predict the future very well. I try never to try to uh, predict uh, the future. But I can tell you that the past does not offer a very uh, pleasant a good scenario. 40, 50, 60 years ago, um, I think CEOs and, and workplaces saw themselves as being responsible to a relatively large uh, set of constituents, not just shareholders, but also the customers and their employees and the communities in which they operated. But as everybody knows, over the last 30, 40, 50 years, um, companies have become very, very shareholder focused and the other constituencies, including employees, uh, the people who work in that organization uh, have dropped off as, uh, have dropped off uh, the radar screen. And so when you look at, um, when you look at work today, essentially when an employee goes to work in the morning, he or she has entrusted their well-being, both psychological and physical, uh, to the workplace. And there's a lot of evidence that suggests that what happens at work has profound effects on people's um, financial well-being, obviously, but also their physical, emotional, and psychological well-being. And so when, when employees show up, they've entrusted their well-being to their employer. And then the question becomes, does the employer accept that responsibility? Or does that employer say, you know, I really want to dodge that responsibility? 
and the history of the recent, you know, the recent evolution of organizational and commercial life has been that companies now seem to be dodging responsibility. So when I arrived this morning at Stanford, I parked my car in a parking garage, for by the way, which I pay $1,000 a year plus for the privilege of doing this in the faculty office building here. And as you stand by the elevator, there is a sign that says, do not leave your valuables in your car. Stanford University is not responsible for basically what happens. And if you, anybody parks in any parking garage, you get a little ticket that basically says essentially the same thing. Uber and Lyft, of course, they've now backed off of this, originally said, we're not responsible for what happens in your ride because all we are is a platform connecting buyers, um, drivers with uh, passengers. Uh, eBay, and they have also backed off, has a statement on their terms of service that says, we are actually not a retailer. We are only connecting uh, sellers of uh, products with buyers of those products. Um, and so you see in, 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 in the world in general, um, organizations saying, we're only platforms connecting people. Amazon uh, you know, connects you in many instances with people participating on the Amazon marketplace. And in each instance that I've just given you, the companies have had to back off of this hard line that we are not responsible for a variety of reasons, including to remain commercially viable. But, but this issue of we are not responsible, I'm only a connector, I'm only this, I'm only that. And companies for years have shed um, workers, uh, they, 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 many people now are on contracts or part-time or whatever, um, to economists basically um, said that between 2005 and 2015 in the United States, not, if you took the number of net new jobs and use that as the denominator. And the numerator was the number of jobs that were kind of part-time gig economy, if you will, jobs, contract work, et cetera. That was 94%. So 94% of all the total jobs created over that decade period from 2005 to 2015 were essentially these jobs for which the employers have relatively low attachment to the employees. So given the history, more, more emphasis on shareholders, less on other constituents, um, more people working in irregular employment relationships. And I should say, uh, hypo, uh, parenthetically, that the Gallup organization has a definition of a good job. A good job is working 30 hours or more a week for, a, for an employer. It's not some kind of gig uh, kind of work. And there is a very strong correlation Gallup has found between the percentage of an economy in good jobs and the GDP per capita and per capita income of people. So good jobs are important. We see fewer good, good jobs being created, more irregular employment relationships, many companies not stepping in to the responsibility they have for their employees. And so I, you know, I mean, the the trend has not been good. Uh, what, whether or not we can reverse that trend, which is what your association is trying to do, and I'm completely behind that mission, um, that, that I think remains to be seen. Great. Well, uh, so that's a, in some way a dire picture, but and you're in the belly of the beast, it seems, where much of the, the trends are also set uh, when you're talking about platform capitalism, et cetera, and, and the gig economy. Um, what do you see are some ways, or what, what do you see are potential ways to go about creating good jobs, uh, creating organizations that have an inner sense for, uh, that, that practice responsibility inside out, not outside in, or only once the media comes or legal tells you it's uh, gonna be a cost effect uh, or something. What, what do you see are some levers? Well, I think, uh, well, you know, of course, the levers are going to be levers that I am more familiar with, so who knows what all the levers are. But, um, but I think one lever is the irony is that, uh, is that many of the things that I just described are not particularly good for the organizations themselves. I mean, there is an enormous body of evidence that suggests, not surprisingly, um, healthy workers, but, you know, healthy in every sense of that word, workers that are flourishing, to use a word that you've already used, and I think it's a very appropriate word, um, 
are less likely to turn over, are less likely in a country like the United States where the large employers basically pay for their employees' health care, are less likely to be a health care burden. They are more likely uh, to be productive. Uh, presenteeism and absenteeism are huge costs. Um, the, United, the, the health and safety executive in the United Kingdom estimates that 50 or 60 percent of all absences are because of workplace stress. Um, so, so, the, so we have created an interesting situation in which nobody is really benefiting from this very much. So one lever, therefore, I presume, it's one of the reasons why I wrote Dying for a Paycheck, it's one of the reasons I continue to do the research I do and post on these topics occasionally on LinkedIn, et cetera, is so one, so one lever, I hope, is education. That when people see uh, the benefits uh, even to the bottom line, let alone to the other human beings, um, that that could be a lever for change. But at the end of the day, if you were to ask me what's really going to change it, I think what's really going to change it is what changed this with respect to the physical environment. That it's going to take regulation, legislation, litigation. Um, that because these costs are externalized, and when 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 people get ill, um, and they um, and when people uh, don't have economic wherewithal, um, unless you've got a country, and there aren't very many, even the United States, that will literally let them die in the street, um, then, 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 then society is going to have to pay for this. So we pay into the public health system uh, for people who don't have health insurance or for people who have been made sick by their employers. We pay in our social welfare systems for people who do not earn enough money uh, to get paid. Uh, to, 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 to survive economically. And so, you know, we decided 40, 50, 60 years ago that we could not just let organizations put their pollutants into the air, water, and ground because number one, it costs more to clean up than it did to prevent it. And number two, they were externalizing their costs. And we now see, I think, companies externalizing the costs of not dealing fairly and appropriately with their employees. So this now gets passed onto the larger society in the form of higher healthcare costs and, um, and, and, and social welfare costs and other kinds of things. Um, so, so there's gonna be a role for government, uh, which is I think gonna be hard to see come about given the trends in politics that we see, not only in the US but around the world, uh, but, but that, so education, I think, is one. Um, regulation and, and, and government intervention would be another. And third, I do believe that there is a role for, for if you will, status and recognition. So you look at who are the most admired CEOs and who are the most admired companies, and then look at the companies on the best places to work list, and there is not much overlap. You know, Amazon and Jeff Bezos are considered to be, you know, visionaries and they're tremendously admired, even though there's been all this stuff about how Amazon is a tough place to work and the warehouses don't have air conditioning and the hourly workers are stressed and the white collar workers are also stressed. So to the, so the, so I think, so one lever education, one lever government, third lever, who do we honor? Who do we think are our heroes? And on the day that we honor companies that, in the words of um, my friend Bob Chapman, who wrote this great book, Everybody Matters, and runs this conglomerate, manufacturing conglomerate, Barry Waymiller, who says, my job is to make sure that at the end of the day, the people go home from work better than when they arrived. And he takes that responsibility seriously. To the extent that we make those people the heroes and we hold them accountable for doing that, then I think things will change. Great. So education, regulation, and and who we honor the saints, the modern day saints uh, that typically don't sort of match right now. They, there is this this uh, yeah honoring and 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 what we want kind of gap uh, in, in a way. So I hear a couple of questions and also suggestions and, and a criticism that the word lever is maybe too mechanistic. And maybe we need to watch our language in terms of a, uh, a more general sort of move from um, mechanistic to organic language. 
uh, well, uh, note uh, taken. Uh, Sharon Turnbull, are you here? Can you ask your question about the role of, of shifts in governance, corporate governance in that process? Yes, thank you, Michael. Um, I don't believe that you need to get uh, the government involved. And my question is, to promote humanistic management outcomes, do we need to transform existing centralized top-down command and control hierarchies on which Coase and Williamson base their work to decentralize bottom-up stakeholder governed networks as identified by the Ostroms that have existed for thousands of years before markets and large hierarchies existed? Question mark. Well, the, I think the answer to your question is yes, except that research by my former colleague, who's now university president, Laura Tedens, and other people suggest that hierarchy is almost inevitable. I mean, I've heard about holacracy and uh, Ricardo Semler in Brazil and all these other wonderful movements. Um, but if you look at them, they seldom diffuse, they seldom survive. And that's because hierarchy is almost inevitable. That if you ask people, if you, if you put people in the groups and say, how would you like to organize yourselves? And you give them a task to perform. They prefer hierarchy. So my friend who's now unfortunately deceased, Harold Levitt, wrote a book, some now probably well more than a decade ago, about this. And he talks about in that book how people have predicted the end of hierarchy for eons and, and it persists. And it's because hierarchy is almost a natural and normal uh, state of affairs. So it would be nice if we had more communal and bottom-up organizations um, I, I don't see that happening, um, given, you know, given the history of, of, of those organizations in the world. Does it depend on the education system? Because the implicit assumption of all business management and schools of governance is top down. Nobody, I'm not aware, I, can you and educate us, is there any way in the world where bottom up governance and management is uh, introduced? If you don't know about it, you can't implement it. Um, that is probably right. Um, I would not give business schools more credit than they deserve, however. Uh, when I am asked often this question by, by people like yourself and news organizations, my reply is that in my judgment, business schools, God bless them, are more reflections of social values than shapers, than shapers of social values. That I, you know, I mean, many people believe, blame, uh, you know, um, Michael Jensen, who I actually know personally, uh, you know, for all the shareholder emphasis um, and the erosion of emphasis on any other stakeholder. And I think, you know, I'm sure Michael Jensen and other people in the business school community bear some responsibility. Um, but basically, I think business schools really are, uh, are takers of ideas as much as, as, of, of, as creators of ideas. And while it would be nice if business schools had more emphasis on, um, not only on, on this kind of bottom up, but also on, on well-being um, and, and the effects of, of management on literally the physical health and mortality of the people who work for them. I mean, that would be a great step in the right direction. Um, in order to run those classes successfully, uh, unless you're gonna get them in the required part of the curriculum, uh, you're going to have to have students who are interested in taking them. And, you know, in my sense is that students are mostly coming to business schools in order to learn how to make money, not how to run organizations that are more humane. If I make two comments, I think Michael Jensen has changed his views for the Nature of Man articles. And when I asked the Dean of Harvard Business School why he didn't teach bottom-up governance, he said there's no market for it. So it's a circular situation of you, you won't get it until there's a market. You won't get a market for uh, a humanistic management until there's a demand for it. And uh, so what do you say? To the, how do we get out of that paradox? Well, I, that goes back to why I think there is more role for government than you may want. But there's also, I think, a very big role for who we honor and who we talk about. And, and you know, you look at these most admired companies lists, and they are oftentimes companies that no normal, rational human being would want to work for. So until we, until we honor what we, uh, you know, my friend, Ken Theory, runs a company called DeVita, and he really has emphasized recognition. And he has a line which goes something like, uh, you get what you recognize. 
things and what you honor. And I think that's, I think that's fundamentally correct in life. So to the extent that you, that you honor and recognize and celebrate um, humanistic organizations, you're going to get more of them. And to the extent that we don't, and we honor organizations that, if you will, are anti-humanistic organizations, then you're probably going to get more of those. Okay, so we have a couple of follow-ups. Actually, uh, Sankey, you want to ask your question? It's pretty much in line with uh, with Shan's about uh, the role of governance. Sankey, can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, Zephyr. Are you able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, so my question is regarding the power structure. So my, my uh, thinking is if, uh, for example, instead of the board of govern directors consisting of, or you can say representing the shareholders, if we have a more diverse uh, board of directors representing employees, uh, local community, etc., then would we expect uh, the organizations to become more humanistic? Yes, I think the answer is um, there are certainly, it's a, as you know, in Germany and a few other countries, there is this uh, idea of having, for instance, employee representatives on the board of directors because the employees' capital, their human capital, is very much invested in the, in 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 their work organ in their workplace, and many people believe they should have a voice. Um, and so, absolutely, to the extent that the board of the, there's no law that says the board of directors has to be basically a bunch of people um, who represent only the shareholders and come only from you know, some law firms, banks, and other big corporations. Uh, you could have representatives, as you suggested, from the community. You could certainly have representatives uh, from the employee base on the board. And that would certainly change uh, the questions that were asked at the board meetings. It would certainly change what the company uh, came to emphasize. So that is a a wonderful suggestion, but that is a suggestion that is not going to be implemented without some regulation or government mandate, because I don't see many companies saying, oh good, you know, let's put our employee, let's put somebody from the employee base on the board, or let's place, you know, we're operating, you know, heavily in certain geographies, let's place some people from those communities, even elected representatives on our board. Um, so, and for that matter, you don't even see them play saying, let's put some customers on our board. So uh, while I think that's an excellent suggestion, um, the issue is going to be how you're going to get it implemented. Great. Uh, John Bunch, you have your question. Are you there? Not Charles Chandler. Yep. Um, yeah, my question was whether the paradigm of shareholder capitalism could be replaced by one of conscious capitalism, that is, uh, where you're aligned more closely around positive values, uh, and that you mandate that organizations must deliver positive good for the common good. Um, so, I think conscious capitalism is a great movement. Um, I've gone to some of the conscious capitalism uh, conferences. I know John Mackey. Um, and the, the conscious capitalism conference, the last one I went to was in San Francisco, and it was basically uh, the believers talking to other believers. And the people who needed to be in that room, and who were, if you will, unconscious capitalists, were not in that room. So my response would be similar to the response I gave to the last question. I think, I think this idea of having people and having companies responsible to and measured by how well they do to various constituencies is important. And you see this now, there is a growing movement. And some, some estimates are now is 25% of all capital is invested in these, if you will, socially responsible um, funds. And there is now this responsibility, pardon me, a growing movement to report on ESG, you know, environment, uh, social, and governance uh, for the performance of companies. And you see Larry Fink, uh, the chairman of BlackRock, which manages, I don't know how many trillions of dollars of assets, um, saying to companies, you have to be uh, better with respect to your environmental sustainability. 
and you now see some growing movement uh, to for shareholder activism in this ESG area. So that could make you optimistic uh, to the extent that uh, to the extent that, the, the, that these measures are going to become more widely promulgated and more widely adopted. And my friend Bob Eccles, who I knew from Harvard Business School a zillion years ago, um, has this uh, social sustainability you know, accounting standards board to try to, again, broaden the range of measures. And I think these are all very important movements because if we've, as we've learned anything from Management 101, or maybe even Management 1, and certainly from the quality movement, the things that get measured get attention. And if it doesn't get measured, nobody's going to pay attention to it. So, uh, so, so the, 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 the issue of measurement, I think, is core to this. You will get more humanistic organizations when we have measures of organizational performance along humanistic dimensions. And that's really going to be, I'm not sure it's going to be sufficient, but it's certainly going to be necessary. And you see some trends in that direction even now. It, thank you. Um, Gerald, uh, Gerald Farias, are you there? You want to ask your question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was basically it's an extension of the same uh, of what you were talking about a minute ago, uh, Jeff, about uh, the this was about the business roundtable declaration on the purpose of organizations. Uh, I was just wondering how how sincere you see that effort or is it just a response to external pressure uh, that that is pushing them in that direction? Well, I think, do you, do I, you think I, it will really manifest itself in reality. It will manifest itself in reality only if and when they put some teeth in it. Otherwise, it's what I think the economists would call cheap talk. So, you know, if I say to you, I am going to reward you as a CEO on the basis of basically a highly geared, um, very leveraged, system in which most of your compensation and most of your wealth is going to come from share price. And then I'm going to say to you, by the way, I don't want you to be so interested in share price. The disconnect is pretty obvious. So, you know, as long as we pay CEOs the way we do, the amount we do, not only the amount we do, but on the basis of most of the pay is variable pay based on stock price. So, you know, so the, so the, so they say we want you to we want you to um, pay less attention to share price, but we haven't changed how we pay you. Nothing's going to change. So we, when they say you know the the company has a responsibility to to, to all these to all these constituencies, but we're not going to measure your performance against all these constituencies. Not much is going to change. So I, I, I don't think the business roundtable declaration is going to amount to anything if you don't change how you pay CEOs and how we measure companies and, and, and their performance, not just in their stock price or their profitability, but also how well they are doing with respect to employee health and well-being, how well they're doing with respect to the um, well-being of the communities in which they operate. Thank you. We have an, a, a number of questions and a lot more comments. So if you have questions, please make sure they end with a question mark so that I can identify them more easily. If they're short, it's better. Um, uh, please keep them coming. And Sophia Tone, uh, are you ready to speak? Hi, yes. Thank you. Um, so my question here, I wrote it down so I be succinct. So your book deals with death. Um, this is clearly a big issue metaphorically and literally in organizations. I'm curious what role you see spirituality or the soul playing in business and in the business school. And specifically, how might society be ready or not for a more explicit emphasis on, whole, on the whole person in organizations, including spirituality, religious or otherwise? Yep. That's a great question. I think, you know, I'm not an expert on that. Uh, I'm a, more of a social scientist than a spiritual, you know, expert on, on spiritual things. But my sense is the following. My sense is, is that um, business schools and other 
<clears throat> similar types of institutions, maybe even companies, have tried to stay away from that, not because they feel spirit or the spirituality is, is somehow unimportant, but because they don't think it's really their role um, to instruct or to guide people in that regard. Because, you know, I think there is, at least in many Western democracies, a sense of freedom of religion um, and, uh, and the idea that, uh, that it is up to the individual or the individual and his or her family or community to find their own spiritual path, that that is really the role of religious organizations, both formal and informal, um, and, that, uh, and that that should be kept separate from uh, what happens in, in the employment relationship. So I'm, well, I'm, I, well, I believe that, you know, that the role of, of, of the spirit is important. I'm not exactly sure in a world in which I think there's probably already, if you read Shoshana Zuboff's writings, too much thought control that you would, I would be a little nervous if Google said, you know, we're going to help educate you in your, in your, in, 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 in finding your way to, 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 towards a good spiritual path. I think that needs to be much more self-directed. Great. So you touched also on, a, on another subject here with, with Google, <laughs> surveillance capitalism uh, that Shoshana Zuboff is, is uh, writing about, and the whole emergence of AI. In what way, I think there are a couple of questions that touch on that. Do you see AI a threat um, and a, a possi possibility to humanize organization to help with some of the intractable problems? Or in what way... What, what is your perspective here? And then there are a couple of follow-up questions on the consequences politically for such scenarios. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the current thinking with respect to AI is that AI just, uh, if you will, automates and makes more efficient um, existing uh, biases and existing, uh, you know, trends. Uh, so AI... AI in and of and by itself is certainly not going to be, I think, a solution to any of these problems. And if you believe things like the McKinsey and some other estimates of how many jobs AI is going to either destroy or at least disrupt, um, it's probably going to make human well-being um, uh, probably uh, much worse off. Uh, but certainly, I mean, AI, you could, I'm sure, uh, program AI to... Uh, I mean, AI is, 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 is a tool, so it, it can be used, you know, in a, in a humanistic and spiritual uh, and, and, and well-being enhancing way, or it could be used in, in, in another way as well, in, in the opposite way, and it depends, upon, um, it depends upon the goals of the people designing the AI systems and implementing the AI, if you will, out, outputs and outcomes. So it's, it's it is itself going to be neither a force for evil or for good, except to the extent that it, um, it, it is used productively and in a humanistic way by the people who are deploying it. Great. There are a couple of sort of follow-ups, I think, from the whole tech evolutionary perspective and the public policy implications regarding uh, the universal basic income. Do you think that would be uh, something that can help with the current issues in organizations with that distract, with that outsource responsibility in the, in the wrong kind of form? What is your take on that? I think that's right. I mean, so um, if, I'm, if my memory is correct, which it isn't always, I think um, Denmark or maybe some of the other um, Scandinavian countries have, have put into place a system that says we are going to let markets work with lots of flexibility. We're going to let companies, um, you know, hire and fire and do things in a reasonably flexible way. But what we are going to do is we're going to provide an economic backstop. So when you are um, when you are laid off because of some change in industry dynamics, we're going to give you retraining. And we're going to give you some economic backstop so you're not going to be like living out on the street. And so I think that is a, I think, I think to the extent that that's called a universal basic income or whatever, I think it's a smart idea as a way of, of making economies uh, both flexible, but also not leaving people behind um, in, in, in the process. So it's a, it's, a, it's a good way of buffering people against forces over which they have no control. Now, I wrote a chapter, ESA, where I visit every year in Barcelona, 
um, their dean, ex-dean, Jordi Canals, had this conference, um, and I wrote a chapter for that conference. And in, in the part, in, in the course of writing that chapter, um, I confronted some interesting statistics, which again are not inevitable and they can be changed. Uh, but, but, but companies, at least in the US, have cut their investments in training because uh, for a variety of reasons, number one, there are fewer employees and number two, turnover is up because the employees are treated so badly. And so, so companies have really cut their investment in training. So when people say to me, you know, training is going to be the way in which we're going to have people adjust to the new economy, I say, yes, that is certainly a possibility, but I don't see it given, you know, given the budget constraints of many uh, countries and given what I see going on with trends and training from, from, from companies. So again, it's, we have to look at, you know, what's actually going on and how can we politically as a, as a society encourage organizations to do the right thing. I think assuming that they're going to do the right thing on their own is not probably going to work very much. Great. Uh, Shelly Brixton, are you there? Can you unmute yourself and ask your question? So Shelley is asking what the role of organizational scholars like yourself, like some of the people that are on the call can be in this whole conversation in this, in this shift. Well, I think our role is to, um, to, the, to, the, to the best of our abilities, do two things, I think. Uh, number one, um, do, you know, develop knowledge and research and help educate um, uh, business executives and also policymakers and also the general public about this, uh, about the situation and about what should be going on and how to do it better. And so I think we have an, edu an educational role. And then I think we have a role, which I certainly try to do to the extent that's possible, uh, to participate, if you will, in the public conversation about these issues. Uh, you know, to post on Twitter or LinkedIn, to engage in conversations, uh, to make, I guess, more salient and more relevant uh, these kinds of topics. So, so to, to bring them to the forefront, I'm a big mm -hmm. believer that what gets talked about is more likely to get attention. And then when things and issues aren't talked about, um, it's, uh, you know, it, uh, they're, they're, they're not likely to get attention. So basically, the, your, if I stay with the language of lever, your lever three status and recognition in the educational and research process, uh, maybe that's a, a piece. Would you disagree? Yes. Yeah. No, I think that's right. Jonathan Gosling, are you there? Can you unmute yourself? Ask your question. Hello there. Yes. I am. Hello. H hello, uh, Jeff. Um, uh, I, uh, the, we, we've been focusing a lot on the, hu the, the human and the human well-being. And uh, clearly, the, the 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 threats of climate change that we're facing at the at the extreme, you know, the, the sort of you know five or ten percent of the distribution curve, the the upper end of risk, uh, which nonetheless we need to take very seriously and prepare for, uh, might make a, a a significant change to the way, to the prominence we give to humanistic concerns and the well-being and and, and considering sort of wealth and. Uh, uh, of, of human beings um, and, and I wonder how you think this might work out uh, wh whether in a sense uh, ecocentric ethics and values might uh, overshadow or con contrast conflict in some ways with humanistic anthropocentric values um, I don't think so I mean I think you know the things that will keep the planet alive or the things that will keep uh, people alive, and I actually, you know, it's interesting. My friend Nuria Chinchia at ESA in Barcelona has this lovely phrase, which I actually repeat in Dying for a Paycheck. She says, "Why do we care more about polar bears than human beings?" Um, I think I think we need to be concerned both about the physical environment, but also about um, the world of work. Um, we claim to be in the United States pro-life, uh, but again, as Nuria Chinchia is fond of saying. In the U.S., we seem to be concerned about life only until it emerges from the womb or at the very end of life. And in the middle, we don't seem to care too much about the people sleeping on the streets of San Francisco and, and all the other things we've done to people. So I, I, don't, I don't see them particularly um, in conflict. I also have to say, 
given what's going on, particularly in the US, but all, in other countries around the world. You see in Brazil with the destruction and the ongoing destruction of the rainforest, um, and certainly the weakening of environmental regulations and air pollution regulations in the US under the Trump administration, it's, it's I really worry uh, for the future of the world, given what's going on and given what's going on with how fast things are melting in Antarctica and in, and in the Arctic. So it's we we need a we need a very strong political movement that the the changes the changes fundamentally the power structure because at the moment the power structure is not doing very well for the world. And then that's Jonathan. You want to follow up? Yes, I I, I think there I think there is a bit of a of a contradiction in in your response uh, to that. Um, it, you know. It, it, it would be nice if uh, the the sort of welfare of the planet and the welfare of, of of people in terms of more wealth and prosperity and health were harmoniously integrated. But uh, as in with so many things, it, it may well be there's a there are trade offs to be made in that. Well, at the end of the day, if the planet is uninhabitable, the, the wealth that you have in your bank account isn't going to matter because you're not going to be able to. So, um, uh, you're not going to be able to survive. And I think also, I, th I think the way you have phrased it, you're completely correct. But to me, um, the well-being of humans is more than just their material wealth. I mean, we have, I see every day in the place where I live, the Silicon Valley, people trading off uh, vacation, uh, time with their family, uh, ability to volunteer, uh, and then they're also their physical health. Um, the Silicon Valley is awash in drugs, frankly, both legal and illegal. As people take, you know, people to try to engage in micro dosing uh, so they can do better on their job and et cetera, et cetera. And so they, and so maybe, maybe we are creating material wealth. We were certainly not creating healthy people. Um, you know, in the United States, the life expectancy has gone down the last three years, though it just turned up this last year. Um, for the first time since I think the Spanish flu of the, of the early 1900s. So you, you, I, you know, I see people who are, who are wealthy, but they're not healthy uh, because they have sacrificed their health um, in terms of the work hours and in terms of what they are doing uh, to earn their living and to keep themselves awake 24-7. So there may be a link to the conversation we will have tomorrow with uh, Jeff Sachs, who's going to be talking about uh, Pope Francis' initiatives. And I think uh, Jonathan and others, uh, I think the current Pope is making the argument that it is all linked, the ecological and the human crisis, they are linked. There may be manifestations, I think, similar to what Jeff here is suggesting here. We, we are not treating ourselves very well. <laughs> and and that, that, that may be a manifestation of how we treat uh, everyone else in the process, including the planet. Um, so just a plug, <laughs> but also uh, Robert Jones, if you are there, uh, the conversation about the legal legal power structure or the uh, changing uh, the legal structure around it uh, could be matter. Robert, are you there? Okay, so I'll just read the question for now. The conundrum here is how to get something that is inherently inhuman, like an LLC, to become humanized. <laughs> Can employees entrust their hearts and souls to something that doesn't have one? And I think there were other conversations before that were linking into the conversation about what is what is the, the legal setup for an organization that we have to deal with and which ones are actually more human and workable. Well, I think, you know, there was a time uh, many years ago, I visited Mondragon, which is one of the largest cooperatives. It's in Spain. Uh, the John Edwards uh, Corporation in the UK, the huge retailer. Um, you know, so there are, I think the cooperative form is inherently more bottoms up, to use a phrase that we've heard already uh, during this session. Uh, the cooperative form, because it is a cooperative and because workers do vote on who their managers are going to be, is going to be inherently more, I would say, you know, um, more humanistic, um, and you'll get more attention to human values and the well-being of the people who work in the organization. Um, unfortunately, the cooperative form is not flourishing, 
Um, but a lot of this again goes, and you use the phrase, and I think it's a good phrase, of the, the, the regulatory and legal framework in which all of this is occurring. You know, if we don't have a lot of cooperatives, it's probably because we don't have laws and regulations that make the cooperative form easy to, easy to form and, and sustainable. Um, the fact that we don't have, and this is such a subject we've already talked about, the fact that we don't have um, employees or community man members uh, on company boards or uh, in, in company governance is again something that could be remedied through changes in laws and regulations um, and, and, and would probably need to be if we were gonna take these other values into account. But the governance, and I think the power structure, the governance structure of both firms and partnerships and everything else is fundamental uh, to, to, to the values that they're gonna express. I mean, if I have, you know, if I have CEOs are making now in the US 300 times what the average work, worker makes with salaries that where you can make, you know, 50 or 60 or 80 or $100 million in a year based upon stock price, I mean, you're gonna get behavior that's gonna be a logical outgrowth of how we've set the, or how we've set up the pay system. You know, people are gonna do what they get paid to do. And so, you, you, and that goes back to this comment about the business roundtable. Unless we change how, how, how the senior leadership in companies get, get, get paid, and not much in their behavior is gonna change. One of your books that, that touched me in some, uh, some let's say, w uh, interesting way was on power and, and how ill-equipped many of sort of the well-meaning people are in terms of touching the subject of power. Uh, and I'm just uh, taking the liberty here to, to ask you that question uh, in terms sure. of uh, a recommendation for many of us here on the call. So I feel that there are many that are concerned with the state of organizations, the state of society, et cetera and power may be in, in the hands that are not interested in these conversations that are potentially psychopathic, sociopathic types of power grabbers uh, that your colleague Bob Sutton calls the assholes. And so in what way, what, what do you sort of recommend your students <laughs> and, and also your colleagues uh, uh, to, to do when they are all concerned, but we sort of see that the power is in the wrong hands? Well, you know, I've somebody who said I was quoted me on saying this. I don't remember having said this, but I like the phrase. And apparently at one point I said, I think somewhere in print, um, that if you want power to be used for good, more good people have to have power. And therefore, they, and therefore you can't say as many of people would like to do, well, you know, I'm not gonna play the political game. I'm not gonna play organizational politics. I'm gonna, you know, hope for the best because uh, you're not gonna get the best. Um, I, I do. I do stand by that quote. You know, if if you if you want power to be used for good, more good people will have to have power, and you you can't get anything done uh, without power. So I teach my students the, you know, the the hard truths of power, and the hard truths of power I think are not always pleasant to confront. So I tell my students on the very first day of class that our course is going to go through, which by the way is available essentially on the web in my personal homepage. The whole courses available, um, jeffreypfeffer.com, um, I tell them on the very first day that we're going to go through some stages. The first stage is going to be denial, where they're going to say the world actually isn't like this. And the second stage is going to be anger, mostly directed at me. And the third stage is going to be sadness. How can the world work this way? And if we are successful by the end of the class, they will come to acceptance and they will, and they will say, well, this is how the world is. And if we are going to change the world and if I'm going to be effective in getting anything done, um, this is this is what I'm going to have to do uh, because you know if you're going to play soccer you need to follow the rules of soccer or football the rules of football or basketball the rules of basketball you can't say you know I'm going to play the game but I'm I'm going to change the rules you certainly can change the rules but you have to be in power to do that. I certainly went through those phases when I, I did that course and when I read your book. So I appreciate it. It is an important, I think, realization. And uh, and I do think all the folks that are in the, uh, the good people or meaning to, to make those important changes, we need to become a lot smarter in, in ways how to how to not get have power in the wrong hands. Um, 
So thank you so much for that reminder. And I think going to into the, into a subject that many people seem to avoid, especially in the social sciences or in in the kind of uh, OB areas, uh, if they don't want to be seen as 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 part of the dark force. Yeah, um, well, and to, and to follow and to follow up on my friend Bob Sutton, who is of course a friend and occasional co-author. You know, he I, I joke that he wrote his first book, The No Asshole Rule, and then when nobody paid attention, he had to write a book ten years later called The Asshole Survival Guide. <laughs> so, yeah, and then uh, we're, we're hoping to, to have Bob on as well. Uh, Amy Bradley, are you there? Because I think that conversation about assholes and how we present ourselves in the workplace uh, does play a role in terms of how we can potentially shift the power dynamics as well. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. I just wanted to say, so I'm good i'm in england good evening good morning i'm enjoying seeing all these moving postcards that's how everyone is like a moving postcard um yeah i just had a question around um it comes from my interest actually in compassion at work and i wondered to what extent you think the prevailing feeling rules in organizations where our real feelings are often not shared and our vulnerabilities are not exposed and instead leaders role model toughness and strength. To what extent does that exacerbate the challenge we have in rehumanizing our workplaces? Well, I think it, it exacerbates it tremendously because people don't behave like normal human beings. Uh, but, uh, but then you have to ask, I think, a really fundamental question based on your, I think, very astute observation, which is why is it and how is it that some people get to the top of organizations and other people don't? And, you know, I mean, it's in, in the book, the Leadership BS, I talk about why most of the recommendations for leaders um, the, to be a good leader, to be a humane leader aren't followed. I mean, we, the research literature is quite extensive on how narcissism is both bad for organizations, but good for individuals in the sense that in the, 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 the evidence is really quite extensive on how being a narcissist is more likely to get you hired, is more likely to get you promoted, and is in fact more likely to have you keep your job. So, so, so you could say, well, you know, isn't it terrible that we have all these narcissists and psychopaths and sociopaths running organizations? And the answer is, of course. And wouldn't it be more humane if we didn't have, wouldn't organizations be more humane if we had different people running them? And the answer to that is, of course. But then you have to step back and ask the question of what is it about this form of behavior that gets them promoted? And why is it? I mean, it is relatively easy to recognize narcissistic behavior. If human resource departments really wanted to not select for narcissists, but against them, they could do that. But, but for a variety of reasons, which would take us a very long time to discuss, uh, to, to me, that's a very fundamental question. Why are we, why is it that, um, uh, to paraphrase an article, which is actually a very nice empirical article, which is titled, it's, um, by Beth Livingston and Timothy Judge and one other person whose name I don't remember. Basically, the title of the article is Why Do Nice, do nice ga Guys and Gals Actually Finish Last? And they measured um, over decades uh, the effect of agreeableness, which is one of the fundamental personality dimensions on salary and found that agreeableness was negatively related to salary overall, but particularly negatively related to salary for men. And then they ran some experiments along this as well. So we have in place a set of systems that systematically are promoting um, certain kinds of people. And if we want to change the organizations, we have to change the systems and the criteria by which people get hired and promoted. It's just really no more um, complex and it's also no easier than that. And so, you know, when, when, when Bob wrote his book, uh, the no asshole rule, he gave me a draft of it. And I said, you know, Bob, you've got a problem. And the problem is, is that most of the people in the Silicon Valley who are running companies who we have placed on pedestals, people like Steve Jobs and Larry Ellison are 
So he added a chapter, which is the virtues of assholes. But in any event, um, this is this is all about who we promote and put in control of our organizations. And we need to understand the dynamics that make psychopathology so attractive. Right, and that's I think a big place for education, and 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 that really hasn't entered much. I think maybe there are other examples uh, from other schools. Um, uh, there are questions by Uchora. Uchora, can you quickly ask? Yes. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jeffrey. It's, it's it's an honor to be in in your presence. Thank you very much. Even though you're only virtually in my presence. <laughs> <laughs> virtually in your presence. Um, but I, I, I've, I've always wondered, what is the role of individuals in all this? Uh, because we tend to uh, look up to businesses, to government, uh, to business schools to change things. But does, does this really mean that the individual is helpless? That the individual on his own or her own can't do anything about this? Um, so, for example, if you're not happy in an organization, must you stay there? If you're not happy with the way things are going, must you be there? Um, what is the role of the individual? Does the individual have a choice? And if there's a choice, what, what are some of the choices that, that the individual can think of? Well, you've, you've I think, posed one choice um, to move. You can change jobs or you can even move countries. Uh, something that if I were 30 or 40 years younger, I would probably do, uh, given what's going on in the U.S. and the trends that are, um, that are present. But I, th I, th I, think, I think we should learn from movements like what's going on in Hong Kong or the Occupy movement, or for that matter, the Tea Party movement, if you, even if you don't like it. Um, I think individuals can do things. Individuals working together can do much more. I mean, I, th I think it is the collective power of organizing. I mean, that was where the labor movement came from. The idea that you as an individual uh, employee in a workplace had relatively limited ability to do much, uh, to change the conditions of your work, even the health and safety conditions of your work. But collectively organized, you could accomplish a lot. So, I, so, so what the individuals can do is they can start nonprofits or collective or organizations that gather people together into political parties or political movements. There's a movement in the United States now to try to get um, 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 uh, paid time off for everybody and, 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 and paid leave uh, for, for issues to deal with elder care or child care responsibilities, family leave policies. But, the, but, the, but the, an individual can go petition anybody, but it's gonna have much more force to the extent that you gather allies and, and tell your story and build, if you will, a movement. So that would be my response. Okay, we're approaching the end of the conversation. I uh, see one more question that I think sort of ties into what the floor is asking. Georgia Nudri, can you briefly ask? Georgia? Okay. I think the question was if you're sort of trapped in this vicious cycle, you don't have power, but you want power, and you're making poor choices in a way that you, you want to be nice and, and uh, you consistently sort of get yourself out of power. How can you break that cycle? I, I guess take your class, read your book. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> and not only take the class and read the book, but more importantly, put it into action. I mean, the, the, the favorite book. And I think he claims it's his favorite book also that we've written is The Knowing Doing Gap, which you alluded to very early in the introduction. I mean, knowledge is wonderful, but knowledge that is not acted on is really not worth very much. So you have to know, but you also have to do something with what you know. And that I think is really critical. Wonderful. I think that's a great ending to this conversation. And I uh, thank you, Jeff, for your time. I thank everybody else for, for being here. What we're trying to do with the International Humanistic Management Association is build these, these groups, <laughs> organize, and, yeah. and, and formulate, a, in a way, plans uh, that we couldn't do otherwise individually as easily and transform education, transform management, uh, specifically the practice of it, and, and bring attention to these topics. And thank you so much for being part of this. Thank you so much for, for helping us with that. And, <laughs> And 
uh, thank you for for being an ally in this in, in, in a mentor and a guide at a distance <laughs> okay and i appreciate the opportunity uh, to be part of your uh, uh, to be part of this event today thank you so much and uh, everybody, tomorrow we are hosting Jeff Sachs on a similar conversation, but transforming the economy, because I think there are a couple of levels that we need to transform, including society and politics and, and those power structures. So wonderful. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Jeff, for taking the time. Much appreciated. My pleasure. I hope to see meet you someday in person. Yes. And everybody, and everybody on the event, I hope to meet you someday in person. I give a much better tour of Stanford University than the student guides, because I've been here much longer. We'll take you up on that. All right, bye. Thank you, bye.